Hi, Vandana. How are you? Uh, hi, Victor. I am good. How are you? Good, good. Um, so today, I think uh, we wanted to chat about this new hip word or pretty much old hip word, but it's been abused uh, over and over, DevSecOps. So uh, tell our members a little bit about what is DevSecOps and why do they even care about it? So uh, everybody talks about DevOps, DevOps, and DevOps. So just imbibing security to it is DevOps or uh, DevSecOps or uh, doing the DevOps securely is DevSecOps, purely if we have to say. And why people should care about it because uh, if we find early vulnerabilities, it's going to be really, really helpful for us uh, because it's going to be easy for the developers, for security researchers, for operations. Even when we talk about cost wise, it's going to be good for us, for an organization. Also, um, when we talk about DevSecOps, it's amazing uh, in the form of a collaboration because uh, it, the pipeline gets uh, released or the one release gets so fast that we all have to be collaborative. So it makes sure that we, all the teams are collaborative. Rather, the application which is going to go live will not be in a proper shape. And then uh, respond to change is so fast with DevOps model that people has to have uh, DevSecOps or DevOps. Earlier, we were developing uh, applications on a very small pace. Okay, we will go live in six months, one year. But now, if we talk about major organizations, they're doing like 36 releases, 70 releases, or even more than that in just one day, which is so quick. So keeping everything in mind, how can you achieve it with DevOps? You can do it. So I would use DevOps often in the talk because Dev, uh, DevSecOps is simply having security in DevOps. Wonderful. All right. Well, seems like you have a lot of uh, lot to talk about DevSecOps or DevOps uh, being secure. So why don't we hand it off to you and uh, why don't you give us a little bit uh, more about it? Back to you. Sure. Thank you so much. So about me, um, uh, I really like working on application security and cloud security. And now I would say DevSecOps. That's why I've not mentioned because the talk itself is all about DevSecOps. I work uh, with a lot of open source communities and conferences. I've listed down, uh, down some of them here. Uh, I haven't mentioned virtually testing here because we're going to talk about it in the end. So here are some of them. And uh, about... Uh, DevSecOps, we would be covering what DevSecOps is, how can we achieve it, and why do we need to have DevSecOps processes um, in our organization or environment? How can we build a security pipeline? And some case studies from the companies that have released that this is how they have developed uh, or they have imbibed the DevOps uh, pipeline in their organization. So this is how uh, the traditional uh, DevSecOps used to uh, look, wherein uh, we were going through the waterfall model. Um, we had requirements gathering, analysis, design, coding, te testing, deployment, all was going on. But that was taking uh, too much time. Why? Because everyone was working in their own silos. Architects will take the... Uh, requirements from the clients, then it goes to the analysis team, whether that's feasible or not, then it goes to the design team, they will write the design, do the, the coding team will, the development team will do the coding, it will go to the QA team to do the testing, then it will go to the production team, and then the whole process will go on and on. But it, the process used to be like, very, very, very small. Like, very, very, very slow, slow. Because we evolved and we made so many changes. The technology has evolved. Every day we see there's something new that is coming up. So with, uh, we came up with the agile, DevOps, uh, organizations executed their product security checks. at the uh, With SCLC, organizations always, I've seen that they executed at the final stage. Now, if we execute at the final stage, it's always a problem. Cost of fixing a bug early in the life cycle always saves the money. Because if you go at the end, you have to backtrack and then you have to do actually shift left and figure out where was the problem and how we can fix it. And then the cost becomes huge. 
So there were certain things that, uh, uh, that were actually challenging in the waterfall model. Talk about automation, talk about the cost, and so on and so forth. The list can go on. Now, security, be security team used to think that we are only cleaning the mess which other team have created, which is not the thing now. There was always used to be a blame game. Like, who has done it? Who is the culprit or who is the bottleneck in the whole pipeline or in the whole, uh, in the whole development scene? Now, development teams um, focused on delivering new application features as quickly as possible, often giving very less priority to the security. Now, if we go back a little, um, like, uh, say, 10 years, when we th started talking about DevOps, that time, we wanted to make sure that Dev and Ops are working together. Now, when we have uh, come a long way, Dev and ops are at one side and security is at the other side. That's how the blame game is happening. But if we think logically, if we don't have security in it, it it'll be a big problem because we've seen the major breaches. The top companies have been breached because of certain mistakes. Now, this is what we actually want, wherein we want to make sure that DevOps or DevSecOps or SecOps or all of us are in a good um, uh, are in a good term. Why we need to be in good terms? Because we want to make sure that our organization, um, our organization's applications are going live on time with security. We don't want anything to be on anyone, uh, any blame to be on anyone. So if we work together, then we can have a better or a beautiful product. How can that happen? This is how a DevOps life cycle look like, wherein um, we have certain automation tools in place. We have a proper plan, plan, in, pla uh, plan in place. Then uh, during the code review, we have uh, tools which can check the code securely and then push it further. There's a, there's a proper test mechanism using certain tools, deployment operations. Everything has a smooth process, but we have to make sure that it goes uh, on a faster pace. So uh, we discussed in the beginning, what is DevSecOps and why do we need it? As I said, it's integrating security practices within the DevOps process. It cannot be separate than DevOps, for sure. It fosters a blameless culture wherein we don't want to blame anyone because we all have the same goal, wherein we want our organization or applications to be secure. Now, how can that happen? We need to have people who are making sure that uh, our organization is secure. So the key is to, uh, the key to good uh, DevSecOps culture is to remove as much as friction we can do from the whole process. So we need to have uh, people who can have that culture uh, of DevOps with security and following the proper processes. But that's not it. We need to have certain technologies. So technology actually enable people to execute those processes. If we don't have proper tools and technologies in place, how can we aim to, get, uh, to make sure that our enterprises are not being attacked? We, uh, because our aim is to reduce the enterprise attack surface and enable effective management of the technical security risks. So we need to have people, process, and security in place at the same time working together. Hey, Vandana. So we have a question uh, for your previous slide. If you go back to your previous yes. slide. Mm -hmm. So the question is that, uh, yes, we need people, processes, and technologies to support security for mm -hmm. DevOps. However, right. it always comes down to cost. It always comes down to money. It always comes down to the, the amount of uh, m money it needs to be invested. So how, how do you suggest or how do you guide our our listeners that uh, they should make that a decent play to convince mm -hmm. their C-suite and board uh, to invest into security. Mm -hmm. So uh, this has to go um, along with the De uh, DevSecOps culture, wherein when we say there are two approaches in this, there's one 
top down approach and then there is a bottoms up approach so when we want to make sure that as development people or as operation as the ground support staff or even as a manager when we want our leadership to buy in to those tools so we have to make sure we show some return of investment to them saying that this is what we are aiming at so we have to uh, speak in terms of what leadership understands because if we say that i want to implement this tool but i don't know what's going to happen next if we say in those language i'm sure they will never approve so we need to build a proper case that this is how we will be going ahead and this is actually is important for our organization uh let's say if we have java code there are certain tools that we can use but there are certain open source tools also which can be implemented in the pipeline so if we can uh, deploy all those open source as a standard or as a benchmark and show yes this is working in our pipeline and we can automate we can reduce the cost we can uh, we can actually uh, try and reduce the time bandwidth and there are if we uh, prepare a proper case and talk in terms of uh, the uh, the leadership i am sure they will buy in not for all the tools but yes some of them they will buy in and it's it's a pure cultural shift approach that has to happen and it's not just has to happen uh, bottom up it has to happen uh, either ways top down bottom up both ways so we also have to understand what our leadership is uh, uh, require uh, they require or they are seeking for Great. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. So this is how a sample DevSecOps uh, architecture look like, wherein um, we have certain pre-commits, hooks, ID plugins, where developers are working, and then we have a code repository. Which uh, in the code repository, generally we have certain uh, versions, and then we manage those secrets in that. Uh, and then uh, if you've heard that there are a lot of organizations uh, they have been breached because there were secrets which were part of the code repo so if we do proper secrets management we run the we run certain uh, mechanisms on our code base to check those secrets whether they are available there or not it can save a lot of efforts then uh, in the pre build and post build we we can have a Uh, software component analysis which is becoming like one of the major challenges for the organization uh, wherein we have to make sure that we run um, checks for third party libraries which uh, we have because in the past uh, in the past 2 3 years we have seen that there are a lot of big breaches which have happened because of the third party um, components that we have used even it has become part of ovas top 10 as well wherein uh, if you are using third party components you know that you are using components but then you're not checking whether they are uh, uh, vulnerable or not so keep a check on them then uh, then imbibing uh, the software uh, analysis wherein we are checking our code base we are doing the static code analysis and similarly for dynamic uh, applications or for in the qa we are testing the, uh, we are having the dynamic checks and all of this when it's there we have an artifact factory why do we need that repo because sometimes uh, we don't want in the initial stages when our organization is not mature enough to take a decision to fail a build we want to make sure that we pass the build but our defects are getting saved somewhere so we need to have some repo wherein all the artifacts all the results are getting saved because if the pipeline is getting passed we are doing the check and if we are not acting upon them that means we are just running some reports and we are publishing it for the uh, for the people who want to seek those we are not acting upon them and then even when we talk about production we need to have uh, certain checks in place which we will uh, go through in the uh, further slides now when we say software component analysis what do we need to check now this code is one code which we don't write because um, we just take the frameworks and start using there are plugins okay let's start using we have our build ready uh, but there are certain libraries missing okay let's download the libraries now all of this when we are doing it we miss to keep a track on them 
And when we miss to keep a track on what all libraries we have and what all plugins we have, those plugins might be vulnerable. And if those plugins are vulnerable, that means your application is vulnerable, even if one plugin has the vulnerability. So uh, the software component analysis performs checks to identify vulnerabilities um, on outdated third party libraries or uh, the plugins. Uh, there is one uh, a tool that I really like. I generally don't promote tools, but this one is very uh, close to my heart because I really, really like that. Uh, I have used it in the past to check it, it as a benchmark, which is o uh, OWASP dependency checker which gives roughly 30, 70 to 80 percent great results if you want to help the project and if you see that there are certain changes that can be made please reach uh, please reach out to the project owners i'm sure they will be happy to take your help and then we have a question now, yes please the tool you had mentioned uh, is there any way that our listeners can uh, see a link or a name of that. Uh, we can post it on the show notes. I, I absolutely. I would post it uh, once the event is done in the chat box or even uh, anywhere you say. I can sh share the links after that. Just go to OWASP dependency checker, but I will just post it. Uh, post the link also after the session. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So. Uh, now, moving on to static analysis security testing. Uh, it's completely a white box security testing using automated tools. So why do we, uh, why do we say white box? Because we have the code and then we are um, bringing on some checks for it. So uh, this is basically, I would say, one of the most important piece wherein it's very useful for weeding out all the, uh, the low hanging fruits like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, or insecure libraries. Just think about certain bugs wherein you can figure out that there are uh, there are certain inputs which you are taking from the users, and you can put in the validation in place at that point of time. So uh, you can have all those checks, and you can actually over uh, uh, you can over, you can oversee what uh, where exactly you can uh, put these validations checks. Now, those tools which are used for uh, code analysis, you can fine tune because there will be certain false positives which you have to check. So you might go ahead and uh, uh, want to refine the reports that are coming coming out of the secure uh, of the static analysis security testing tools. Let's say if we are using any commercial tool, also uh, they're not always hundred percent accurate. So you will have to take a look at uh, the code and the report that has come out. Moving on. Now, when we say dynamic analysis, it generally can be um, a black box or a gray box testing uh, using the automated tools if we are putting, in, uh, putting, uh, putting it in the uh, life cycle or uh, the pipeline. So uh, in, in case of SAST, which is a uh, static analysis, you may not get the full picture because the application is not deployed. Uh, certain checks like uh, business logic testing or uh, the test which are done for session management, you might not be able to check. So you might want to run it in the whole in the pipeline or you might want to create a separate pipeline uh, to keep a check on them. And um, with dynamic analysis, you can actually have prior set of configuration settings to give uh, the better results. Now, uh, when we say uh, the whole DevSecOps piece, people want to have the environment set up as early as possible. So infrastructure as a code is like, uh, it, it gives us um, an edge wherein we can do the version control with infra and uh, it allows also to uh, uh, perform us audit on our infrastructure. Talk about Docker, Kubernetes, Kubernetes. So this infra relies on base images. So we can just pull in and uh, set up our infra with the requirements that we have. So uh, with infrastructure as a code, it gives us a, a, a an edge wherein we can maintain our infra was just writing the piece of code and uh, we can spin up instances. But if we have properly secure uh, configuration, then that becomes like a cherry on top of a cake. 
Now, this again, clump compliance, attaining compliance is like one of a very big challenge for any organization. Talk about PCI, HIPAA, SOX, or any other organization, uh, uh, the, any other compliance. Now, um, uh, we have seen that we have GDPR, we have uh, CCPA, so many compliances are there. Now, how can we make sure that we have a proper set of rules and we are covering all, uh, all the test cases that we are required uh, to be compliant with. So at least compliance as a code can help us wherein we can write our recommendations and we can use those tools. There are many tools available in the, um, as open source which we can use. Now, with vulnerability management, we have everything in place. But we have to make sure we are managing the vulnerabilities properly. All the reports that we are getting from uh, 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 software component analysis or uh, um, from the secure code review or from the dynamic testing, we are actually managing the vulnerabilities properly. Because if, as I mentioned, if we are not checking those reports, then it, we can be in big trouble because we are just running the uh, running the scans and finding the bugs but we are not fixing them we need to have a proper place we can have all the reports finding which bugs to fix we need to prioritize that this bug has to be fixed this is an external application and there is a critical bug which we have to fix as soon as possible we can't go away with that or we can't get away with that Alerting and monitoring is again uh, an important piece wherein uh, what security measures we have in, may, uh, in our environment, we are checking them properly. We are monitoring it. We are monitoring our applications because if we have proper or uh, effective security controls, we can actually figure out when did an attack occur? Uh, was it blocked or not? What level of access was achieved? what data was bought in and bought out because if we talk about one of the breaches uh, that happened uh, uh, recently or it's not so recent but yeah equifax then they, they had monitoring systems which i read through a certain blog posts um, but that was not configured properly so we have to make sure that we have proper alerting and monitoring in place and um, another piece associated with it is that we need to have proper repository for our assets because uh, if we don't know our assets, we can never monitor them. So we need to know our assets. Now, uh, cloud native approach is almost similar, but we need to understand which cloud can cater to us, which tools can cater to us, what tools our environment need. If we have Java in place, we can't use the Python tool or whether that's useful or not. So what our environment needs, it's very, very important. Now, uh, here, there are certain tools and uh, tools of trade we have here, I've listed here. Uh, this I've got from uh, one of the presentations in the past. So uh, wherein for threat modeling, there are certain tools which are available, which are open source and uh, uh, which we can use. So if the dependency check is the one that I was talking about. So we, uh, for threat modeling, for pre-commit hooks, uh, uh, for software component analysis, for static analysis, for secret management, for vulnerability check, uh, for uh, infrastructure as a code, for web application firewall. So you can also go with uh, OVAS Mod Security Project, which is an amazing project. They have a lot of uh, webinars done, videos done. Even when you go to the project, it gives you a great view that why we need to have web application firewall in place. Moving on, now we've talked about the technology, how DevSecOps can be built, but that needs to have a cultural shift. Someone asked a question in the beginning that how can we buy in? Now, uh, we'll talk about these two approaches, which I highlighted, wherein we have a top-down approach and then we have a bottom approach. When we say leadership, we all need to come at uh, one, one table and talk. Why do we? Uh, uh, why do we need certain tools? Developers do need to lead the way. So, um, 
leadership needs to come in terms wherein they ask okay we need to move uh, we need to move to devs, devops model what tools you require will they be useful and um, same goes in organizational tra transparency wherein organization needs to be very transparent wherein this is what we want and this is what we can give you can we manage so uh, uh, now when we say devops dev and ops both needs to share their inputs whether it's feasible or not we all have to come in one term and leadership needs to um, break the silos and the barriers which have been created okay this has come from top we need to follow or we want this to get this uh, we want this to be done as soon as possible this is never feasible so uh, leadership also needs to break down certain barriers and start speaking that yes this is the requirements and this is what the end input we uh, when and output we are looking for and uh, as i mentioned that how can we make our leadership uh, buy in on that please speak in executive speak wherein tell them what they need as in um, show them the results that these are the results we are trying to achieve and uh, how can that happen now we have built a use case but before that we need to make sure that we ourselves are strong strong enough can we have certain um, uh, people who are the champions who can actually vouch that yes i am i am taking a lead from the operations team and we will make sure that we both are on the same page we need to have an inclusive and a collaborative culture because if development team is saying something else operation is saying something else and security is saying something else we cannot have a beautiful product any which ways we all have to make sure that security is part of everyday process because this is the first and foremost thing if we if we take security as an afterthought um we will see issues like uh, uh sql injection rcs uh, which are remote code executions and many more vulnerabilities in everywhere the most successful devsecops implementation happens with uh, security is when security is actually not an afterthought it can never be an afterthought the leadership and developers do not have to think about security it has to come naturally and i know that we have been uh, doing the like, developers have been doing their work operations have been doing their work but suddenly they have been forced to do security as well it will take time wherein uh, we train each other we come on a conclusion wherein we interact with each other so we have to make sure that security is part of all of us it's not just security it's not the, just the security team it has to be part of the whole um, ecosystem also uh, we interact with uh, multiple departments day in and day out uh be it networking team be it any other team hey one so, of you have a question yes please <laughs> so the question is that how much overhead does it add when we interact with different teams or departments i'm going to come to that for sure i'm coming to that awesome <laughs> yes so um when we say it's one of the important aspect uh, like devsecops is one of the important aspect or security is very important it's actually very challenging also in a traditional way because we have multiple uh, teams working on this 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 there are certain things but think about how can it be overhead wherein i know this is my code and this is going to go to the production but if i know certain tips and tricks and i can build my code securely and i just have to give a heads up to the security team i've done this there are certain issues which i can see that the tool is flagging Uh, i see that it's a false positive can you just take a look at it now security team says that this can result in something else can you fix it this way if we both are speaking in the same terms trust me it will not be a overhead there will be certain challenges but yes it's not going to be a overhead now um think about if there are three teams working in like just complete silos and there is a big vulnerability that has come in now development team has said that we can't fix it right now because it's not a priority 
and it's a critical bug, but it's an internal application. But suddenly, we made some changes after three months, and that vulnerability became a critical one for all the whole organization. Don't we want to fix it? We would want to fix it. But if the teams are working in silos, that will never be fixed. Security may have certain easier approaches to some issues, let's say uh, authentication or authorization issues. And similar way, I would say development team might have a better way to, uh, to fix a bug, which let's say I might not be able to suggest. They will say that th if we this way, that this, organize, uh, this application will be secured, uh, securing other things as well. So it, it's like, it's not just development and operations team have to be working together. Its security team also has to, uh, has to be in the common terms. Now, embracing the automation is the most uh, amazing piece. So uh, people have been asked like, if we automate things, uh, are we gonna lose our jobs and whatnot? No, it's gonna make it easier. So if we, uh, we have a build, and uh, we are making some commit and during the commit itself, if we find bugs, how easy it is. We know that there are certain bugs and we're gonna fix it. Autom we can automate, uh, automate as much as humanly possible. And then security team can actually teach dev and ops to understand the results. Like uh, once uh, I've seen a scenario wherein there are multiple development teams and uh, we have one tool, which we can create multiple instances and only those teams can access, let's say there's eight teams, they, they can only access their results and they know that there are certain findings. They can look around how I can fix it. And if they don't understand security team is there, but they know that there are certain issues that are there. They will understand the security automatically. And when we uh, add security into each phase, including requirements and design, it will lead to less failures because the teams themselves are doing security. Security team is just gonna be their help when they need it. It's not just security team is coming in and becoming a, a showstopper. It's we all are working together tightly and working on. Um, so if we talk about manual process, it's gonna fail. It's gonna, it, it might get bypassed. So if security is tightly coupled into the automation, it's gonna give us results. And as I say, artifact factory, even if we don't fail the build, but we will have artifacts and we can fix it. And also to highlight here, um, discovering a security threat at such a late, late step wherein we just, we have covered the whole uh, 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 feature request. And then we are figuring out where exactly we made mistake. It's gonna be a, uh, it's not going to be a preferred fix, but then we have to fix it. Let's say if there's a, a SQL injection in some big application, fixing uh, that bug will be big troublesome, will be big, big overhead. Now, this slide I really like, wherein we are creating champions within the teams. Let's say I know someone in development team who's very enthusiastic about security. Then they understand how security works. So they become a champion. Then it goes to some other team. Uh, let's say I as a security person uh, or we as a security team train some, security, uh, some people on security. They further train some more people. So we all understand some bits and pieces of how, why we need security and why it is required for an organization. Again, cross-scaling. And when we say cross-scaling, it just does not apply to dev and ops team. The uh, security team also needs to understand why development team uh, or what development team is doing. Because if we, uh, if, um, we as security team don't know it, we can never be able to support each other. So security team has to understand what dev is doing, what ops is doing. Ops need to understand what security is doing or what dev is doing. And from, as a security team, uh, we can sponsor certain developers to get the training on secure code review. It just doesn't need to be just the security team. So if we have certain sponsorship, we can actually help them in getting trained. And it's a big, big, big shift to a culture. Now, um, uh, we were talking that we, we all need to have a, a 
sim, uh, same table wherein we are talking in the same term. Now, if I give you an example wherein uh, there's a SQL injection and there are two approaches to it, either stop the release or we can, uh, we can let the uh, release go on and we fix it uh, as soon as the slide we uh, give one day, uh, uh, one day window to fix it. Or we can have it fixed in the code itself. Which one would, would we apply? Like second one would be very easy for the teams. Ki haan, we are going to production, but still we have a bug which we will fix within uh, one day. But then the third one wherein we are fixing early. We will, let, we will have very, very, very less overhead in that case. Now, uh, the example that I gave on the, uh, on the high finding, wherein we know that there is a bug, which is a high CVSS, let's say 9.8. And right now we are saying that, okay, uh, we, we can't fix it. We'll see when we can fix it. It's a medium bug. But then with certain release, it becomes a high. And we all are working together. And we will know, okay, this, is, this bug has become uh, a critical or a high bug for us. Can we fix it? Now we all are working together and fixing that bug. That solves a lot of issues. And as a security people, we have to make sure we invite dev and ops to our parties. It's not just all the parties, like the real parties also. Wherein we are talking, we are giving them, uh, we are actually making them comfortable that, yes, yeah, security is not your enemy. Security is always been uh, seen as an enemy or wherein we are not, not good friends with each other so when we connect with each other we we can actually interact more we can uh, we can learn more so um, this is one of the architecture which uh, ABN Amro released as that how they uh, release their uh, pipeline but remember that no two organization can have or might be able to have the same pipeline because they might be using certain different procedures, tools, technologies, the mindset. So uh, we need to uh, build the DevSecOps pipeline based on our, uh, uh, our organization, our tips, tools, tricks that we have. This is another one from Fannie Mae. So we can go through uh, the results they published and these are some key takeaways wherein we have to build our own umbrella. We cannot rely on someone else and we have to get on, uh, get that open as soon as possible because we don't know when we see the rain of bugs and security is everyone's responsibility, not just developers, not just operation, not just security, but everyone who's working on it, even the person who's spying in the leadership and uh, there have been questions in the past that would it replace the pen test activity? No, it's not going to do that. It will have the pen test activities that we are doing that will have its own bug way, uh, finding the bugs, way of finding the bugs. So it will never replace. It will ease off certain um, challenges wherein it will just automate the, uh, the bug finding in the dynamic testing part it will never weed away the pen testing activities. Also, we can have certain uh, pa parallel pipelines wherein uh, the other pipeline can be solved and fix the bug. And then the similar uh, thing can be implementing in the production. And don't take risk to generate the business values, which is so important. Don't take uh, or don't accept the risk wherein we uh, as an organization fail. These are some references which I took help from. And uh, you can also go through them. Those are very, very amazing uh, places wherein I went and uh, took help from. You can reach me on Twitter. Uh, my DMs are open. I'm on LinkedIn. If you have any feedback or if you want to share something, please, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I am generally very responsive on these two places. Thank you so much for listening to me. And I'll hand it over to uh, Victor to take you further. Victor, over to right. Yeah, thank you. That was amazing. I think uh, most of our listeners were enjoying. There were a couple of questions, but uh, not that many. So I'll I take that as a good sign. <laughs> well, as Vandana said, that uh, we we have a lot going on as far as goes to 
this year. Uh, we have webinars, we have events, we have a lot of things going on. So if you would like to be part of us and uh, either as a volunteer or want a membership or you just want to know more about virtual testing, just let us know. Um, go to our website, www.virtualtesting.com. We have social media presence, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. This slide deck and video will be posted on YouTube as well. So you can go check it out. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so chapter leadership. Um, we have a couple of leaders uh, for this virtual testing chapter, including Vandana. Thank you, Vandana, for that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm um, glad to be part of it. Yeah, and we're expanding. So we just started a new chapter in UC Berkeley. Karen is uh, uh, leading that. Then uh, Pradeep is uh, going to manage one of the chapters uh, in East Coast. So we're opening a chapter in uh, India, Southern India, and Northern India. So our members, if you are in those regions, uh, let us know. You might want to get connected with the local chapter leaders and uh, attend their meetings. All right, let's go to the next slide. Chapter activities. So virtue testing is not only about meetings and meetups and webinars. Um, our goal is also to help out nonprofit organizations, people who don't have nonprofit status and yet they would like to receive donations uh, under the tax code where they can, uh, they can give that donation receipt. So that's called fiscal sponsorship. So that's one of the things that we're going to focus on this year and next uh, to help out those communities and groups and activists where they don't have the status nor the resources to carry out their missions. That's our mission to help them and uh, to enhance the platforms to give them more, more visibility into, into their mission. Once again, 2020 goals. Um, we have fiscal sponsorship, education, uh, a lot of stuff going on for 2020. This slide is just to talk about uh, what we have events. We have an executive roundtable going on. Uh, once again, we're not just about events and uh, meetups and webinars. We are more to it. So please go ahead and uh, go to our website, virtuetesting.com. Get familiarized yourself. We have local chapters. You can get involved. All right, let's go to the next slide. And if you have any questions about virtue testing, please contact us at camp contact at virtuetesting.com. Vandana, thank you so much for your time, for your presentation. I enjoyed it personally. Uh, thanks so much for, uh, for coming on board today. Thank you so much, Victor, for inviting me today. Um, and uh, it's always glad, good to be connected with you. <laughs> so thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, our listeners. Thanks so much. Great.